All right, let's jump into Quantum Mania. We're going to give you Rotten Tomatoes. We're going to give you IMDb. We'll even give you the cinema score and the synopsis here before we dive in. So, Quantum Mania, very noticeably, has the second lowest Rotten Tomatoes score for any Marvel project, uh, Marvel movie, and any Marvel project. 48% on Rotten Tomatoes, 84% from the audiences. Stark contrast there. 6.6 out of 10 on IMDb, and also has a B on Cinema Score. Uh, synopsis reads Superhero partners Scott Lang and Hope Van Dyne return to continue their adventures as Ant Man and the Wasp. Together with Hope's parents, Janet Van Dyne and Hank Pym, Along with Scott's daughter, Cassie Lang, the family finds themselves exploring the quantum realm, interacting with strange new creatures, and embarking on an adventure that will push them beyond the limits of what they thought possible. So Ricky Flicks kicking off Phase 5 of the MCU. A lot riding on this film with the introdu introduction of the new big bad, King the Conqueror, Jonathan Majors, one of the household names in Hollywood at this point. Look at, he's pretty much like the prodigal son at this point to carry both... We have Creed 3. He's got magazine dreams that he's like being praised for his performance. And now next big bad Thanos level for the MCU. What was your anticipation level going in? Not necessarily did it live up to it, but what did you want to see from uh, Jonathan Majors and company here? Yeah, my expectations were sky high. I think they have to be um, with the introduction of the big bad of the future of Marvel. And I think what Marvel has been doing, and they become an like they become a product of this because of them, themselves and the expectations they put on themselves, is they this is a pedestal for him. And I think that for me, I wanted to see a clear vision, like at, throughout this movie of Kang and his presence in the MCU. And with that, Ant Man, not necessarily a, a list superhero, but a Paul Rudd Ant Man that's beloved by audiences. So I wanted to see just Ant-Man the way we've seen him, but maybe a little elevated because Ant-Man, Ant-Man and the Wasp in our solid movie category for MCU tier. So like the fourth tier. So not an all-star solid movies. I was, my expectations was an all-star, an all-star movie because I think just Peyton Reed, third installment of this Ant-Man franchise, Paul Rudd coming off the highs from Endgame and the impact he had there, uh, Ant-Man that is. And I think, with a Jonathan Majors, who's the hottest commodity in Hollywood right now, or one of uh, on the actor level, I think they had this had the mix to be an all star plus movie. So my expectations, as a again, because of Marvel for the most part, were sky high. Yep, definitely sky high, especially like rebounding a bit from Phase Four. Uh, the reason I wanted to see this movie on Thursday night was for Jonathan Majors, one of my favorite actors going today. And when you hear that the next big bad is just going to be, it's not a cameo. He's going to be a villain in a phase five movie of like a solo adventure for one of our heroes. You're like, I got to see this. This is going to be extended screen time. This is going to give us a proper preview to what we're going to be seeing for both phase five and phase six in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, for God's sakes, there's an Avengers movie named after this guy, right? This, this is must watch if you're a Marvel fan. Right, Maybe if it was an Ant-Man movie that was introducing an Ant-Man villain that we'd never see again, would people actually go see this in volumes? Maybe, you know, probably on the same level of Ant-Man or Ant-Man and the Wasp. But now it's the third movie in this trilogy. We love Paul Rudd in the role. We, we enjoy the supporting cast. It's now time to raise the stakes. And what I was thinking, if you bring in Jonathan Majors here, starting off or like setting the tone for phase five and six, are you going to be able to keep the identity of the Ant-Man movies? Will they be able to have the fun that they had in their small niche portion of the MCU and still bring that to the quantum realm? Were they successful in that? Somewhat. Okay. I wouldn't say completely. And we're going to get into it with this review. Uh, let's go into Kang the Conqueror, Ricky Flex. This is someone that it gives us the substantial reason to see it on opening night. How did you think Majors did in his first theatrical turn as the next big bad? So he was very good. All right. But they, the refuse, I don't, we're not doing spoilers, but the refusing to talk about him 
right? They they draw they drew they drew out the intro to Kang. They built it up so much that it built it down. Like there was way too much build up for his introduction that it kind of took away from it. But then he takes over in the last part, last half of the movie. So yes, he was great. Um, he takes over the intensity, uh, the intrigue with his character, the dominant force that he is, is there. And I think Jonathan major shows that, but I think the movie itself kind of took back from that. And I think, Hey, if we just drop him right from that, start of the bucket or whatever, I think it would have been much more effective. You know what? I was starting to think like, Hey, maybe he's getting overhyped. Uh, people think about like Thanos. We didn't get real Thanos until infinity war. Now we're getting like what we think is going to be similar to what we're going to get in like King dynasty after the post credit, maybe not so sure, but we think we're going to know Kang by the end of this movie. And I got to say, Every scene in this movie, the best ones were with Kang. And it, it wasn't with the supporting cast. I was pretty disappointed by the supporting cast in this movie. But Jonathan Major didn't let me down. And I think it actually goes into your point, Ricky Flex. It almost felt like he went too hard for an Ant-Man movie. You know? Like, he wasn't... Like, it looks so good to have, okay, we're raising the stakes for Ant-Man. We're going to the quantum realm. We're going on almost, it looks like a cosmic adventure. You know, even though it's in the quantum realm and we're going to give him this level of villain, but maybe he just wasn't the right guy to be the villain in an Ant-Man movie because he did kill it. Like even when, before we get to know who he truly is, he's like his relationship with Janet Van Dyne previously in the quantum realm, it, it was really good. And it, he, 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 he had a sense of compassion towards him. And when you see the villainous turn he makes, and when Janet Van Dyne finds out more about Jonathan Majors in like uh, more about uh, Kang, then you started to see the potential and you see how good of an actor Jonathan Majors is. His facial expressions in this movie, very impressive. Like he is, he outclassed everyone in this movie by literally a light year. He was impressive. And, I it, if the movie just wanted to generate excitement for the future of the MCU with him at the center of it, I think he can shoulder the load based on this performance. What I think where I think this movie went wrong is the decision making regarding a lot of its characters, especially Kang the Conqueror. We're, we'll get into it a little bit more when we go into the spoilers section. But I thought he kind of killed it. I thought he just slayed it. I, I don't, it's like people are saying, well, I don't think he's Thanos yet. I don't think it was at the performance of Infinity War or, end, or mainly Infinity War for Thanos. But I think it was a hell of a debut and it was a nice tease for the future of the MCU. Yeah, hell of a debut. I, can't, I couldn't agree more because it, it did feel out of place that like if you think about the first Ant-Man movie, like you have Darren Cross and you have Darren Cross in this movie as a joke. And then the second movie, you have a ghost slash Florence Fishburne where I forgot about her last episode. So then you just lay us Jonathan Majors for Ant-Man 3. I think that goes a part of the expectations with this movie. What we were talking about earlier is that Ant-Man and Ant-Man Ant -Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp, the first two movies in this franchise, they were solid. They weren't good. They weren't, they weren't great. They were good. But when you add on a Jonathan Majors Kang here, you're thinking, okay, that's what's taken this franchise to the next step. That's what we wanted to see, and that's what the expectations were. And I think that this movie just held him back. It held, it held this movie entirely back by their decisions around him and the execution around it, where, spoiler alert, I think this is going to be another solid movie, a solid Marvel movie. And it's kind of insane from where like the Marvel universe started and the, you know, they, they took so much pride in the heroes and the Chris Evans of the world, the Robert Downey juniors, the Chris Hemsworth. And what was the flaw of the Marvel cinematic universe, the villains and how these movies ended. And now it seems like kind of the opposite where it's more about how are they handling the protagonists of these movies, the decisions regarding those characters, as opposed to, the villains, the villains are the strong points of the MCU right now. When you look at the past three the theatrical turns the MCU has had, you have 
Kang, the best part of Quantum Mania, right? I'm willing to say that on the record right now. Namor, Wakanda Forever. The criticisms about Wakanda Forever were not involved with Namor. He was not the issue. He was not a part of the core issues of that movie. Thor Love and Thunder, the best part of it was Christian Bale in one of like the bottom tier movies in the history of the MCU. The villains are not the problem anymore. It's crazy. It's now become either them not understanding like what stakes need to be held for these characters or it's like the trying to involve a larger part of the MCU. That was a problem in Wakanda Forever where they're trying to add a couple things and they want to make sure you you make sh- it, they make it be known that this is an MCU movie. This movie actually didn't have that issue, right? It felt like a, it was a bigger bad it's exploring the quantum realm, but it wasn't trying to force upon these other characters in the MCU. In the movie, they weren't trying to expand this movie, right? They weren't trying to expand the MCU and get you hyped for phase five, other than the fact you had the big bad that's going to be prevalent in the next couple phases. Where does this movie go wrong for you, Ricky Flex? Where does it kind of have a mishap? If you think you ha- it had any, <laughs> you know, that had had mishaps. <laughs> I don't want to speak that's... for you. <laughs> no, like there were. Man, I, where do I start? Um, I think a lot of times we talk about pacing and how movies divided up into three acts. And I think a lot of times in a lot of our reviews, we talk about how slow a movie is. This movie was not slow whatsoever. So you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna give it a positive, like positive review here on the pacing. I'm going to say this movie was too fast. The second act flew by like it was Usain Bolt running the 40-yard dash. It was incredibly fast. And to pair that with a quantum realm with green screen galore and poor editing where we're jumping scene to scene, setting to setting, absolutely atrociously, I think that messed up with the flow and pace in the movie as well. Um, So not only was it fast, poor editing, pacing uh cinematography with the green screens bill pope i'm looking at you matrix we talked about it last episode i think there were positives it wasn't all bad but there were some clear green screen issues here in this movie um so i was a little disappointed with that a lot of mcu tropes with the green screens and cgi um i think there's a lot more i could say um but i'm going on i'm rambling here i'll throw it back to you i'll say some later so i think my big beef with this movie you talk about the pacing. This movie was over two hours long, but it didn't feel like it was two hours long. And I mean that in a negative way, which is like kind of shocking because you would say like, oh, it, di- it didn't feel like it's runtime. It felt like the writing was super underdeveloped for a lot of these characters. And the characters you wanted to see on screen, I guess, in with increased screen time, it, it wasn't there, you know? Uh, I think they did an okay job with the Cassie and Lang, uh, Scott Lang dynamic, the father daughter in terms of like them not seeing one another because of the lost time between the two. But when it came to like characters that we were previewed, like a Bill Murray, Bill Murray had such minimal screen time. I won't do any spoilers here that it was just, it upset me because like when you have a character like Bill Murray entering the MCU, you want to see more than you want to feel like he actually cares about the universe. You want to feel like he wasn't there on set for one day. And I guarantee you he was on set for one day of this movie, unless they cut out his scenes. When you have like William Jackson Harper, who people are talking about like, Oh, is he going to be part of the fantastic four? Is he going to be this or that? Like there are fans of this actor. And when he has such minimal screen time, it disappoints audiences, and when like they show up later in the movie, you're like, "Oh, I forgot they were even here," you know. And the supporting cast directly in the family, Michael Douglas gets zero screen time, and he has such a tight relationship. This is the third movie in a trilogy, right? So we're talking about like like we're doing talking about Guardians of the Galaxy, wrapping up right storylines, showing the connectivity of these characters, how they are. It's a small sense of community between these characters. You didn't sense that at all in this movie, you know, like, like Scott Lang and Hank Pym get zero screen time together. And I thought, oh, sorry. Let me just finish this really quick. And you name this movie Ant-Man and the Wasp and the Wasp is nowhere to be found. This goes into what I talked about with the bold predictions. If I I knew this was going to happen, I think every MCU fan knew this was going to happen. Yeah. The last movie was called Ant-Man and the Wasp. Okay, 
This story has nothing to do with the Wasp. And it's a superhero. It's someone that's featured at the end of Endgame, even though, like, hey, should she have been featured at the end of Endgame? Does anyone care about this actress? Did if Angel Evangeline Lilly were her scenes cut because of her thoughts on the vaccine? That's possible. Right? It's I Disney. Forgot about that. I like, totally like, I feel, and there was parts of this movie you talk about the editing it felt like it was chopped up a bit i'm wondering if these actors actually had screen time they get cut away and when you have michael douglas actually doing something of impact and or something gets thrown in there for his character it feels random and then oh all of a sudden it makes sense in the third act a little bit you know not even a lot of sense it's hey. just like oh yeah this happens too like the writing Every of this movie was pretty word. bad it, the, his his lines i felt so bad for him Michael Douglas does not deserve the treatment he got in this movie. Paul Rudd was fine. He did his thing. And I He's thought Paul there Rudd. was actually some cool visuals in this movie. I don't have as much beef with the CGI aside from MODOK, which we'll get to. Yeah, I was going to interrupt you and say when you're going on like who what, who like didn't have enough screen time. I'm like, what's this? I was going to ask you, what's this movie even called? Ant-Man and the Wasp. She was not even in it. Her only lines in it, the or every time she was on screen and she had a line, it was always Mom, you never talked about the quantum realm. How were we supposed to know? <laughs> like, <laughs> that was her only lines throughout the entire movie until she comes out of nowhere in the end. It's just like, what the hell? I, I, I'm i done with these titles. Uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Media. If the next, there will be another Ant-Man movie, clearly. There, they cannot include the Wasp in the next one. I, I, I'm boycotting it. I'm boycotting it, unless she's going to be in the movie. This is it. I, I will also just mention, because you did also say a couple other names, Michael Douglas, I think you hit the nail on the head. Not a lot to do here. And when he did, I felt bad. Probably the he's best. He's Hank Pym. He is he's, the original Ant-Man. How like, is he not more this part of this man, movie? This his, man, his, him, his, his father before him, and then him, have been in Hollywood for how god dang long. And you're giving him a line every goddamn word on a book by Ant-Man is the most disrespectful thing in his career. Oh, my that God. That was ridiculous. This man has won an Oscar. That, is, that was crazy to me. Um, Michelle Pfeiffer, I want to call her out. Whoa. I Unexpectedly like Michelle good. I thought she was great. Was Unexpectedly the- really good. I did not see that coming. I did not see a performance. She actually cared about this. I, I, I was I was dumbfounded. When you said call her out, I thought you were about to say like she was bad. I thought she was awesome. She is Surprisingly. someone. Surprisingly. She is an older actress who has not felt a sense of belonging to the MCU, even with Ant-Man and the Wasp. It felt like, oh, my God, let's just grab Michelle Pfeiffer as a big name. It's almost like a, a contradictory type of casting, like Michael Keaton, right? I think Batman Returns and Batman being the villain in uh, – spider-man homecoming and now you have catwoman from the burton batman movies now joining us somewhat of a hero with powers in the mcu she is not mailing it in she is awesome when she's bouncing off jonathan majors and that was one of the positives of this movie and an unexpected surprise and i thought it's just so fun to like when an actor buys in you could tell when other people are there just to be there She's actually like, this is like, a. am getting a substantial amount of screen time. I'm going to make the most of it. That was a good decision by the writers here. But to push aside someone of the Michael Douglas stature, who has meant a lot to the Ant-Man franchise, was despicable. Despicable. And I'll, I'll mention, I'll, I'll reiterate your take on Cassie Lang. Not bad. Um, didn't blow me away. Not bad. Chemistry between Paul Rudd and her, pretty good. I, I think that's a positive. Um, but just to go back to the Bill Murray thing for a second here, and I'm going to connect it with the pacing of this movie. All right. Bill Murray. So we, we saw this movie Thursday night at 11. All right. So the movie didn't start till like 1125 after trailers. I fell asleep during the Bill Murray scene. I wake up and then it's the end of the Bill Murray scene. Um, and then I watch the, I, I, I'm, I stay awake the rest of the movie, but throughout the rest of the movie, in the back of my mind was like, did I miss something here? Like, did I, like, miss a piece of the backstory? Because, holy crap, there was so much backstory in this movie at such a fast pace that they just pushed through the plot, like, to put the plot plot, plot forward. Like, I, I the entire movie, I thought I was forgetting something where I, I was like, did I fall asleep in another scene? That's how fast this movie was. It was unbelievable. I, I was really just taken aback by the pacing because we usually don't have this take at a movie. 
I, I or especially a superhero movie. There was a lot of exposition talk in this movie for a movie that you didn't feel like you were sitting in there for a long time, for an extended time with a scene. And a third you know? movie, in a, a trilogy. We're in the third movie of a trilogy, and there's a lot of backstory. Yeah, it's tough because you want to keep it to around two hours, but then you think about entering the quantum realm itself, how this is going to have new rules to it. Right? It's going to have things that your audience is going to have to learn, just like the characters are learning. So they want to put you in like the perspective of those characters who are experience, experiencing things for the first time. And it's like there, things need to be explained. But could you do it in a more entertaining scene? Probably. Probably. Um, I do want to talk about another performance here. And one that is, I wouldn't even say divisive. I think there's actually been a positive reception and I think uh, with Corey Stoll as Modoc, right? So the CGI looked awful. We can agree to that. But it seems like online, people are like, hey, Modoc was one of the best parts of this movie. He looked so bad, it made me laugh every time I saw him. And when you think about the character of Modoc in the comics, he looks ridiculous. So it's just like, this is one of those moments where I think they're okay with the look of Modoc and the poor CGI, because he's an ugly looking character in the first place. And he's supposed to look weird and awkward. And that's what we got here. And when he put on the mask, we're like, thank God. But at the same time, I was laughing my balls off whenever he was on the screen, except for some of his dialogue at the end. And that goes into the that's writing again, where it's like, you're trying to have some of the dialogue, especially at the end where it's supposed to be, it almost like makes you realize you're in an Ant-Man movie but it's too wacky. It's too silly. This is where you think about, we're going to transition from a guy who's saying, I am not a dick as loud as he can. And then we're going to go to a serious scene between Kane the Conqueror and Janet Van Dyne. That's where it feels like, how is Jonathan Majors a part of this movie? There would never be a point where like Thanos is in a movie and someone would have that type of line. And then we go to him talking about how he is viewing himself as saving the universe right? By killing half of its population. Like to me, it's like, this is why you shouldn't have had Jonathan Majors here, or you got to temper out what you're getting from some of these supporting characters. That was so over the line, some of his line with some of like his lines in the movie. So uh, what were your thoughts on MODOK? Do you think he served a well purpose in this? I thought it was, he was funny. You, you, you are right. I think I was going to mention interrupt and say, you're right. The, the ending scene was cringy. Just terrible dialogue, and there's a lot of bad dialogue, particularly in the third act, and some of the intense scenes and dramatic scenes that were just poorly written. I'm going to call out in a bad way Jeff Loveness, who wrote this movie, um, Jimmy Kimmel writer. Not the not the greatest with dialogue. He's just He's not, writing King Dynasty, by the way. Which is a problem. Um, I think that's a problem. I think going now to the overall movie, I think this movie in the first 10, 15 minutes when they're not in the quantum realm, I think for the most part felt like an Ant-Man movie. Very funny. You have Scott Lang doing the narration, going through his book. Um, yeah, and I think there's all like you have the Jimmy, Woo, you have a Jimmy Woo uh, appearance here. Like, I think that felt like an Ant-Man movie for the most part. But then when we got to the quantum realm, it just didn't feel like an Ant-Man movie. And that's fine. Like, honestly, they're like we said, they're solid movies and we, had aspirations for an all-star movie. So let's go for it. But I think just Jeff Loveless, Loveness, this writer, just like if you look at the first Ant-Man, that was so much more funnier. And I think a part of that is having a Michael Pena in the cast, a David Dalshaman, who was also great in this, but only a voice in this movie. And other T.I. I thought was funny in the Ant-Man movie and Ant-Man and the Wasp. I think the different writers, you have Eric Summers, Ant-Man and the Wasp. And then you have... At you have Adam McKay and Edgar Wright who wrote the screenplay for the first one because Edgar Wright was supposed to be the director of it. So I think you could see the clear quality levels of writing between this one with the dialogue specifically with this one versus Ant-Man. I think that was a big issue, um, at least for me, where I wouldn't be cringing like in the first one versus this one. I'm cringing at some of the dialogue Modoc has near the end or some of the dramatic scenes that Paul Rudd has near the end. And I know we're at opposite ends of Paul Rudd. I think he was fine in this. He was okay. I wasn't expecting like a Jonathan Majors type performance, but I just wish they gave more justice similar to a Michael Douglas. It's like they couldn't find the happy medium 
with the comedy along with the seriousness that needed to be taken. The stakes have been risen. You have the next big bad who is not a comedic character. Jonathan Majors is not comedic at all in this movie. So it's like when you have someone so over the top like Modoc, and you're leaning into how bad the CGI is and then you top it off with like the poor dialogue and the jokes that don't land, it doesn't help the movie. It doesn't help me as an audience member take this seriously as a third installment of Ant-Man, something that's going to raise the stakes in phase five and six of the MCU and generate excitement for Kang the Conqueror. And then we'll go into the ending with spoilers because I think there's been, there was something inherently funny about how this movie ended and it was perfectly Ant-Man, but at the same time, maybe not best for the next big bad of the MCU. Is there any other flaws in the movie you want to highlight? You talked about Catherine Newton. I, I thought she was okay as this character. I, I think she did a serviceable job. I do think there is something wrong with how they treat her and like the Pims and the Van Dynes, like how they treat Ant-Man at the beginning of this movie. Uh, they have no respect for what Scott Lang has accomplished. He is the reason that Hank Pym is still around. He is the reason that Janet and Hope Van Dyne are still around. It's without him. They don't take down Thanos. They don't go down the time travel heist and restore the population of half the universe. And then when you have the daughter... This is like also, it's not about the performance, it's about the decisions made by these writers. When you're saying like, who it seemed like fa- he's been a, a great father when he's been around, right? Scott Lang. But all of a sudden he's like a bad dad because he doesn't care about the rest of the world as much as he used to. I'm like, dude, he did his part. He saved half the universe. He's, he's got to tell his daughter, your stepmother, your your step grandparents who you have such a loving relationship with, they would not be around if it were not for me. He did his part. I don't understand because like the first two Ant-Man movies, the daughters always love Scott Lang. When did they stop? When did she stop hating him? She must be thankful. He came back it, to me. It was just BS how like she went in on him in this movie after there was no remnants of that in the, in the previous two. Yeah, that it made no sense. Like, how could you get mad at him? He's like, oh, what do you do now? Like, you're just writing books. It's like, yeah, I'm writing a book of how I saved half the universe. Like, how could I think that, I that's should? That's what you should do. That's I think like, everyone that's deserves that. That's I think, a motivational story. Yeah, I, I made no sense whatsoever what was going on. But you know what's even crazier? I think, yeah, sure, she's doing this activism stuff. I think... This might sound controversial. I'm not trying to get into politics, but you've been in jail three times. How about you simmer down? Like, how could you say, don't worry about it, dad? You're 16 years old and you're going to jail three times? Shrunk like, a cop car. <laughs> like, that's that that's got to be a felony. Crazy. That is. Like, oh, like, I understand. I don't even know what she's like. I forget what she was like, at, like protesting for. But I was just like, holy cr- oh, homelessness. Homelessness, people. But I was just like, Holy crap, how could you not flip out as a parent if you're going to jail not once, not twice, but three times? That is the most absurd thing that came out of this movie. Yeah, crazy. There's no respect for all the accomplishments of Scott Lang, where he started, where he finished. If anything, he's a great dad just based off him as a role model. And saying he's not an Avenger, where do they get the gall? I don't understand. Where did they get the call? They're acting like he was a servant to Captain America. I mean, there must have been footage somehow of that airport scene. And when you have that guy going, looking like the size of a like a a thirty store a skyscraper, taking down all these heroes, you think he's not like a relevant hero? You know, just to me, it's like, come on, come on, it's your own family, especially Hank Pym, who was him. He was Ant Man. You know. And he didn't accomplish, he didn't save half the universe. He should be happy he used all his particles and he used like his technology to help save half the universe. That part should have been mentioned, maybe. Yeah. Terrible. All right. Scores. Let's go into scores for uh, Quantum Mania. What did you give this first installment of Phase 5? You gave it a 65. Okay. A uh, f- few major issues, lots of minor issues, but overall, like, had a great villain that I think we're getting accustomed to now, but 
I'm still not, I think you mentioned it at the top. Um, I'm still not accustomed to it. That's new for Marvel. Great villain. Um, and overall, like I'm still invested in Marvel. They're trying to make me not invested. <laughs> we talked about the low in the beginning. But overall, like I'm still invested. Um, so I'm gonna go 65 here, just above uh, Thor: Love and Thunder, um, a doc in the in the same realm as like a Doctor Strange multiverse of madness. And we'll talk about the tiers, but 65 out of 100. Yeah, I went 68, and um, the big reason why is because I think the goal of this movie it was kind of like to pay homage to Ant Man and the contributions of Paul Rudd and, and company to what they've. Uh, accomplished in the mcu thus far in their participation in the mcu so far but i think it's mainly because of the introduction of the next big bad and in terms of like generating that excitement i think they were successful all right we'll get into spoilers and say how they might have not uh, they might have uh faltered a little bit in that regard but 68 mainly because i'm so pumped that we have jonathan majors it's at a time of the mcu where I think we're missing some of the high profile names that we're accustomed to the big stars and not only in the big name characters, you have someone that you now trust and can hinge upon and you might be seeing again, even prior to the Kang dynasty. And to me, that gives us hope. The kind of hope that Ricky Flicks was missing when we were talking about phase five earlier this episode. 